Welcome to this new uh, EMCDA webinar today. Uh, I would immediately leave the floor to our director, Alexis Guzdil, for his uh, introduction. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, so uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be with you today for this uh, new webinar of uh, EMCDDA. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a very key, very important topic for that is uh, cross-cutting all areas that are related to drugs, being policy, being responses, being prevention, treatment, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and I would say that also the cannabis-related issues are a perfect illustration of the complexity of drugs issues today. Just a few facts. It's uh, the fact that the concentration uh, uh, of uh, cannabis in THC in the EU has doubled in the last decade. We see the appearance of uh, uh, those uh, CBD products or low uh, THC or products that are called light cannabis. Um, we have seen uh, uh, also uh, the evolution of the knowledge uh, about the medical use of cannabis. Uh, but also the appearance of uh, uh, false uh, announcement regarding uh, supposed or pretended properties or therapeutic properties uh, of uh, cannabinoids. We have seen uh, more recently uh, new products uh, coming essentially first from the states in the US uh, that decided uh, to legalize recreational uh, use of cannabis, such as edibles, containing some of them uh, huge quantities uh, of, uh, of cannabis, uh, but also the e-liquids. And uh, last year, for the first time in February, the early warning system on new psychoactive substances detected uh, through a seizures uh, in Sweden, uh, the first uh, uh, seizure of uh, e-liquids containing 95% uh, uh, of, of THC. There is also a, a, an increasing pressure from cannabis producers towards lawmakers, uh, being in countries that have adopted the legislation uh, regarding uh, medical use of cannabinoids that includes provision for the production of, uh, of cannabis for that purpose, uh, or pressure on countries that have not yet adopted such a, such a uh, legislation. And uh, in some of the debates, it, uh, it may look sometimes uh, as if a market was going to achieve uh, what anti-prohibitionism didn't so far. Uh, some, uh, some of the uh, defenders of such an option pretending that uh, the miraculous solution would be thanks to the new green gold, a new tax income uh, from member states that desperately need to rebalance their budget, especially following the COVID pandemic. Is it as simple as that, or do we miss the broader picture? Uh, you, you understand already with the, the way I asked the question that uh, for EMCDB, the question is certainly more complex and more broad. And the, the objective of our webinars in general, and this webinar in particular, is to document that complexity and to reflect about the consequences for policy. Uh, so it's not a webinar, it's not a consensus conference, it's not the purpose. And, uh, and uh, we like and we need to have uh, key uh, speakers who have uh, specific competences and uh, we don't expect them to agree always. And, uh, and we like to have sometimes some disturbing presentation that give us food for thought. So don't uh, expect this to be uh, the new official campaign or the new official conclusions or the new official report from EMCDD about what you should think or not on cannabis. Uh, it's extremely important to use all evidence available to see in what uh, terms and in what conditions there are some needs to uh, uh, maybe uh, continue what we already observe, which is uh, uh, maybe a paradigm shift that is progressively uh, coming in Europe. And I want to thank Eva, Marie, and Jacob for having accepted to be the guest speakers. And I hope to some extent, the empêcheurs de penser en rond, those who, who don't uh, allow the unique thinking or circular thinking, but who will bring and share to us, share with us uh, new fresh scientific evidence. 
I will join you also for the conclusion of this webinar a bit later. Have a nice webinar. Thank you very much, Alexis. And I would like to introduce Jane Montaigne, the head of public health unit at the MCDA, who will be the chairman or the chairperson today. Uh, Jane, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Marika. Um, a real pleasure to be here and, and chairing this session, this conversation. Um, and, and maybe just a couple of, of practical points. Um, the first one that we envisage uh, a series of webinars focusing on cannabis. So this is the first. Uh, so welcome to this. It's in a sense setting the scene. It's a taster. Um, and in later uh, webinars, we're planning to address different issues, different policy issues, maybe look at markets, product types, other types of responses. So, so if you enjoy today or, or it whets your appetite, please come back because we're, we're planning a season uh, on this topic of, of cannabis, which we think is really important. Um, second point, this is also a teaser for the launch of a new EMCDDA product. It's it's a, an update of our European Health and Social Responses Guide uh, to Responding to Drug Problems. And this time around, it's, it's a fresh, fresh new product that's got lots of mini guides. And the first one is launched on the 18th. So not this Monday, the Monday after. And it's going to be focusing on health and social responses to cannabis problems, hence uh, the link to this webinar. So, so please put the date in your diary. Um, and uh, there's even a code, QR code, if you, if you would like to, to follow the mailings and the updates on these mini guides. Okay, that's the house business. I'm going to now jump in. So I'd like to welcome three excellent speakers. And they've, they've been invited because of the breadth of, of the, and their differences. They're covering different areas from epidemiology, um, clinical issues, social policy. So we're hoping to get some kind of different angles in on the topic. We have Jakob Manti um, from the Institute of Clinical Psychology and Psychotherapy, Dresden University and also University Medical Center Hamburg Eppendorf. We have Eva Hoch, from the Department of Psychiatry, Ludwig Macmillan University, Munich. And we have Marie-Geoffrey uh, Rustide, whose works at INSAM, National Institute of Health and Medical Research in Paris. And she's also on our EMCDDA scientific committee. So welcome to our, our three guests today and our presenters. And I'm going to jump straight in now, if I could invite Jakob to tackle um, some of the questions. We've got three, three broad questions um, that we're going to ask our presenters. At the end, there's going to be an opportunity for you to come with questions to the presenters, but I'll kick off. Um, and Jakob, I would like to begin by asking you to give us some first thoughts from your perspective on how, how you would see that the cannabis situation has changed compared with perhaps 10 to 20 years ago. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jane, for the kind introduction. Um, I want to talk uh, about uh, the results of a study that we've just published two weeks ago uh, to answer your question. And I hope everyone can understand me well. I just had some internet problems like two minutes ago, but I'm so far so good. Yeah. Also Great. So, far, so, good. Uh, so maybe you can jump right into the first slide. Perfect. So what we have um, set out to explore in our um, paper that was, uh, as I mentioned, published two weeks ago, is the uh, assessment of how cannabis use and how cannabis harms have developed in the past decade between 2010 and 2019. And uh, what we have um, uh, collected is First of all, prevalence of use. Uh, as you can see here, the past month use and the near daily use, the latter is a common indicator for uh, risky cannabis use. And as you can see here, the circles uh, present uh, past month use. This is usually the upper line uh, in each uh, plot and then the triangles present the da uh, near daily use. What uh, the colors um, uh, represent is red color is increasing use and green color is decreasing use. Although we were not able to statistically 
uh, test for trends, uh, meaning that what you can see here is just uh, a comparison of the first and the last point. And if the last point was above the first point, we would speak of increasing use. Well, generally what we observed in the data that is collected by the EMCDDA uh, published on their website, uh, many thanks for that, by the way, uh, and uh, confirmed by uh, the focal points uh, in each um, country member state. And I've seen um, some of you are also attending the webinar. Uh, what we've observed is a general increase in cannabis use. Past month, cannabis use has increased from about 3.1 to 3.9%. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, there's uh, many red lines in the plots. Uh, so this means that in nearly every country, we've seen uh, more or less meaningful increases in uh, cannabis use. And what we also observe is that the trend of past month use and near daily use is rather parallel. So the percentages of users that uh, report risky use, meaning near daily use, is rather constant. Um, but what we all, what we actually observe, and which uh, is quite meaningful, I think, is that the share of users reporting near daily use is quite different in the different countries. Um, We've uh, come up with the figures that I didn't include here, but you can look at the paper. Maybe we can uh, reference it somewhere later. Um, in about half of the countries, 20% uh, or more of the users indicate that they are using cannabis daily or near daily. And as we know, this is a specific risk factor or it increases the risk for uh, health outcomes, for adverse health out outcomes, for example, uh, developing a cannabis use disorder. And yeah, this should be um, giving us some thought uh, on, uh, on how to uh, think about uh, cannabis use and um, uh, the distribution of use in, in European countries. There are some countries reporting very high rates of uh, near daily use, it's for example, Portugal, uh, where 70% of the uh, users reported to be uh, daily or near daily users. So um, next uh, we have you uh, looked at uh, treatment uh, rates and how they changed uh, over time in Europe. So treatment rates are uh, a common indicator um, used in, in various ways and, uh, can, and they can be interpreted in various ways. And I'll uh, come to this in a second. Um, first of all, it's important that we've uh, seen an increase in the treatment rates from about 27 to 35 admissions for cannabis use problems per 100,000 adults. So meaning uh, about a 30% increase. In the same time, uh, the number of treatment centers providing data to the EMCDDA has decreased by about 8%. So this gives us um, uh, a rough idea that actual treatment rates have probably increased in Europe in the past uh, decade. Uh, but there's also some important notes um, to be made here. First of all, the heterogeneity, heterogeneity that you can see in the data uh, with Bulgaria reporting nearly no treatment rates and Ireland reporting very high treatment rates uh, is not reflecting the prevalence of use or the difference in prevalence of use uh, because the gaps are not as large. It is related to, uh, to treatment systems. It is related to reporting uh, standards. Uh, it is uh, related to um, factors that we don't uh, fully understand right now. Um, and it is important uh, to just give you an example for this. Ireland, for example, uh, with, which had one of the highest uh, treatment rates, uh, reported uh, data from 600 centers uh, in 2019. And in Austria, which has uh, doubled the population, uh, had only data from 125 centers. It could mean that the centers are just way larger in Austria, 
but also in Austria, we didn't have any data from low threshold uh, treatment facilities. We didn't have any data from general practitioners or from prisons. So this gives you an idea of how the data quality looks like right now uh, when we come to treatment demand. And um, this needs to overcome. We have to uh, get some kind of uh, common reporting. Uh, but um, despite all this, uh, it uh, can be assumed uh, that overall cannabis trade, uh, treatment rates have increased. And there's a couple of reasons or explanations for this. Uh, for example, rising use, as we've seen in the first slide. Uh, then, of course, uh, it, cannabis becoming more acceptable to speak of, uh, becoming more um, uh, portrayed in the media. So perhaps people are more willing to admit that they are also having problems. Then what could also be is that people are being referred from the legal system uh, to uh, treatment centers. We don't have any data on this. Uh, and it could also just simply be that there is a higher availability of treatment. Um, so all this uh, needs to be followed up. And one important issue that has been mentioned in the literature is that higher THC levels also can be linked uh, to uh, the development of cannabis use disorders and uh, overall problems with cannabis use. And so this could be uh, also a, uh, an explanation for this, uh, which we uh, actually followed up uh, or looked at in the uh, third uh, slide that I'm showing you here. Uh, which is the median THC levels that were identified in herbal cannabis and in a resin. And uh, what you can see here for each country are two different lines. Again, the same colors, uh, green and red. And uh, in uh, the uh, lines, there are circles and triangles. And the circles are herbal cannabis and uh, the... Um, <clears throat> triangles represent uh, resin or hashish. And usually resin uh, contained or is containing more uh, THD than uh, herbal cannabis. Uh, this has to do something with the production method. And overall, we've seen uh, quite pronounced increases for herbal cannabis, uh, overall a doubling uh, in the past decade and uh, for resin a nearly tripling of the median THC values. Uh, as you can see here again, there's a uh, quite, uh, quite large uh, variability between countries. Uh, look at, for example, Denmark, which uh, reports consistently very high levels of THC in resin, but we don't have any data for uh, Denmark for uh, herbal cannabis. And then France, this has been reported in the literature before, has seen quite a pronounced increase in resin uh, in the past decade. So um, why is all this important? Uh, THC levels, as I said, uh, is increased, uh, is associated with increased risk for cannabis use disorder and may also be uh, associated with higher risk for psychosis. Uh, what are the reasons for all this? Um, the literature says reports on uh, improved uh, growing methods in both uh, foreign and domestic markets uh, for resin. This has been observed in Morocco, which uh, is one of the, uh, or appears to be one of the core supplier for uh, hashish in Europe. And, but this could also, could all not really be tested empirically. And one of the reasons why it is hard to test is we don't really uh, have very reliable data on THC developments in the country. Just to, uh, just to briefly note that what you can see here is mostly data reports from uh, police uh, agencies, from uh, law enforcement agencies and they often do not disclose their methods of analysis. Uh, the literature also reports that if you take a sample of cannabis, uh, give it to five different laboratories, you get five different, quite different uh, test results in terms of THC. Uh, again, uh, with lower quality um, cannabis, um, for, uh, if, especially when it's being grown outdoor, uh, the variation within a plant or within uh, a bulk uh, of THC can be quite large. So um, not knowing exactly uh, how these data 
uh, uh, were arrived at um, is complicating uh, our insights or the, the the degree of the evidence that we have uh, on, on 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 the trends of THC in Europe. And um, as you all know, reporting no methods is um, a no no go for most um, uh, for research in general. But I mean, this is what we have to live with right now because this is what we get. And um, there's only one exception or a few exceptions. And one of the uh, notable exceptions is the Netherlands, where they um, do uh, test purchases of cannabis in coffee shops regularly. They, they report the methodology and uh, surprisingly, they didn't really uh, see uh, uh, notable increases in recent years in THC. Also, uh, yeah, yeah, Bob, just, 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 just to say you're, you're beginning on your second question. So maybe I could just um, part, move on a little bit to then the second. Yeah, I was done with it anyway. That, no, that was great. I was hearing you were beginning to move. So, so just, just to, to share with, um, with, with everybody what we, we were then interested in hearing. So after, after sort of looking at the 10 to 20 years, and I, I've heard rising use, but some var variability. Um, there's some increases in treatment demand, but again, it's a bit complex and we need to unpick a little bit what the different types of treatment systems is, and also rising THC levels, which could be implicated in those harms. Of these, and, and, and also in your other work and experience, what, what do you see the pressing, most pressing challenges right now? Uh, from again, from your perspective, and and in your view, is the current po uh, cannabis policy debate having any impact in terms of these pressing challenges? Yeah, um, the uh, all the red lines that you've seen uh, in my slides are just red lines for now um, that have to be interpreted and that have to be most importantly translated into health harms. Are we actually seeing an increase in health harms in European countries or not? So this is the, the question that we have to move on uh, with research right now. So mm -hmm. I think that's uh, quite important to really focus on what does this mean really for users mm -hmm. and for the public. And uh, to uh, for this, we need more reliable data. I'm coming actually uh, more from the alcohol epidemiological field where we have uh, much better data uh, owing in part to uh, legal markets, uh, but also uh, because uh, research was not um, uh, made so complicated for uh, a long time. Uh, so that's uh, quite important to note. And for, as uh, with regards to your second part of the question, is the um, policy debate helpful? I would say it's both helpful and not helpful. It's helpful in the sense that it's uh, pointing out that it's not only health harms uh, related to cannabis, but also social harms uh, due to persecution. For example, in Germany, we have seen rising numbers of um, persecutions uh, in the past decade or two. And of course, uh, these are uh, just additional harms to users that are not necessarily linked to health, uh, but uh, they are existent. And it's also important to really focus on these. Uh, but they are not helpful, these discussions, because they are often only focusing on uh, the social harms and the question, legalize it or not. Uh, but we need to uh, broaden up. We need to leave the room for health um, aspects of uh, cannabis use. Uh, just an example, uh, in a recent survey among North American uh, cannabis users, uh, four out of 10 users did not believe that cannabis can result uh, in a dependence. And I think this is where we, uh, where we can see a gap between the uh, evidence that we've collected already and the current discussions. And I think uh, this uh, gap needs to be closed. Great, thank you, Jacob. And I think that was a, a good um, leading to our, our next speaker actually in, in terms of the the, the harms. Perhaps I could now invite Eva, um, Eva Hoch to um, have, a, have a go at answering our first question and from her, her, her perspective um, on how cannabis situations changed um, in the last 10 to 20 years. Thanks, Jane, and hi, everybody. Um, 
maybe a sentence about my person. I'm a cannabis researcher and I'm also a psychologist, a clinician, and I have a um, special focus on cannabis use disorders. And I do a lot of trainings um, in the treatment of cannabis use disorders, not only in Germany, but also uh, in neighboring countries. So I have a strong focus and view on uh, scientific evidence, but also the patient and um, treatment settings and treatment systems. And that's my focus today on your question. Next slide, please. And what, can I, what I can say from my perspective that in the past 10, 20 years, um, the picture has become much more complex. As said before, we have potent products on the market and we have an increasing diversity in products. We have uh, multiple formulation, modes of administrations, and um, especially we have um, larger variability in uh, edibles, um, beverage not so far in Europe, but uh, in, in the Americas, vaping devices and dabbing that's not so coming in, uh, common in, in, in Europe so far. And we have a large and growing um, CBD market. So we have in uh, all European countries, we have retailers, we have internet shops, and um, there is a lot of marketing of the health benefits of these uh, uh, products. And uh, the, the risks are not so clear. And uh, CBD is largely under study. We have very little studies so far. Some of them, they uh, indicate health benefit, for example, in people with psychosis. Uh, but in, for other mental and physical diseases, we clearly lack uh, information. For example, can CBD be helpful in people with a cannabis use disorder and other um, addictions? And we only have a handful of studies and only one of these studies has been published before. And also the legal status of these products is unclear. Is it a medicine or a novel food? So um, there is much uncertainty so far. And of course, we have cannabis as medicine. There is an increasing demand in Europe. There is proven benefit for some health conditions, for example, chronic pain. But again, we have a large knowledge gap in other mental and physical disorders. And uh, we really also have conflicting data because the basis is so uh, small. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to come up with a recommendation who should be uh, treated with cannabis medicine. For example, someone with a cannabis use disorder. Is THC, for example, uh, appropriate medicine <laughs> or CBD? We don't know so far, but that's a novel approach. Next slide, please. So what I can see in, in Germany and other European countries, we have a shift in the perception of cannabis. Is it something good <laughs> or is it something bad or can it be both? There is a heated debate. Next slide. And when it comes to the treatment of cannabis use disorders, we see it's the number one drug in uh, children and adolescents when it comes to uh, drug-related hospital emergency presentations. Um, it's mentioned, um, I think that's the third most um, drug in those older than 19 years. We have a European report published in uh, 2020 showing these data. And as mentioned before, treatment demand for cannabis has increased in the past two decades. And it seems to stabilize at the moment at a historically high level. But it's very little we actually know about these people who come to treatment. We know in outpatient treatment settings, um, over 80% are males, 50% of those are daily users. We know that they start cannabis use at the age of 17 and they come to treatment at the age of 25. So you can see here there is a large gap. What happens in between, between 17 and 25? We don't know. And we have very little information about these people who come to treatment. And especially we have very little information about those 
who don't want to come to treatment. And um, outpatient setting is the one thing, but there are other treatment settings, for example, psychiatric hospitals as I'm working in. So uh, we know, and I can tell you from my perspective that cannabis has become very co common and popular um, among uh, patients with mental disorders. And in our group of young psychotic patients with the first episode of uh, psychosis, um, all of them are using cannabis and uh, they start at an early age. And um, as we just found out in a survey, they prefer a strong cannabis product, which may not be so good for the prognosis of the psychosis. So we really miss information on a broader level, on a European level about treatment seekers. And uh, we know a little bit what is effective, uh, mostly brief or short-term interventions up to 12 sessions. And uh, these interventions which are applied in Europe, they are either cannabis specific or they are general substance use uh, treatments and they both work and there seems to be a preference in some European countries for um, either cannabis specific approaches or general approaches. And usually these programs, they combine motivation enhancement and cognitive behavioral therapy. Next slide, please. And what I can see from my perspective that there is a shift in treatment uh, paradigm. We move from an abstinence paradigm to controlled use or reduced use or harm reduction. That doesn't apply to all European countries and all settings. And the positive side to this is that more groups of patients can be reached, but the negative side is that there is confusion in treatment settings and teams about the most adequate treatment goal to a patient. Yeah, Who should become abstinent or who should uh, control or reduce the use? It's, it's not so clear. And we do have a lot of challenges, um, especially how can we address and reach the young and problematic cannabis users. They are often not interested in, in change or in treatment, and it's difficult to, to reach them and to motivate them for change. Um, the next thing is, um, how can we increase knowledge about cannabis use dis uh, disorders? For example, in schools, they are often not recognized. And um, yeah, often in treatment settings, um, there is a need for training and often there is no specific training available and no money for this. And what I can also observe in the past decade, there is little diversity in the existing treatment approaches. Uh, between 2004 and 2007, some cannabis specific programs have been developed and tested and implemented in Europe. But since then, very little happened. And we still have high relapse rates and we have people with comorbidity, comorbidity and we, we don't have approaches for these special groups of patients. So we have very few novel approaches. And from my perspective, e-health is not established. That would possibly help to reach uh, new groups of uh, people. And also we do not have effective psychopharma, uh, pharmacotherapy. So just as I said before, is CB some, CBD something interesting? We don't really know so far. So I observed in the last 10 weeks, little political will and effort to give money to move forward. Uh, in, a, in a good direction. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. That was, that was really, really stimulating. And you, you've moved on um, and answered very much uh, part of the second question, the challenges, which I think you've explained really clearly to us. Just uh, if you had any other follow-up thoughts on the, the current policy debate itself having a, a particular impact. 
in terms of the challenges for particularly you were talking about young people treatment um, yeah. and cannabis use disorders is yeah cannabis is a top issue in in <laughs> in the media in 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 the, and in the public in the, on the internet it's 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 there yeah and it's it will stay we have to face cannabis yeah and we have to give it the attention i think it needs um we know a little bit or not, not a little bit we have knowledge about those at risks it's clear that uh, young people at early age or daily cannabis users or those who are um, vulnerable for uh, mental disorders or also women, uh, breastfeeding or pregnant women. We do know that there are um, very vulnerable groups and we, we should be clear and have clear uh, messages. <laughs> and we really need, um, we, we need uh, to start uh, to do more prevention right now in schools, but also uh, beyond. And I think we should use uh, this, this current uh, debate <laughs> to be uh, more open to talk to each other and uh, to establish more political will to see uh, both sides of the medal. There is a uh, benefit from cannabis, or medicinal benefit, and there are risks. And so it's not, uh, we have two sides of the metal and we have to recognize that they do exist. Great, Thank, thanks very much Eva. And we'll come back to you for the third question in, in a moment. Um, but, and I, I will just take a quick chair's prerogative to you flag two really other important issues we've got publications on, which is the low THC, products and the medicinal use of cannabis products, which we're updating. So if anyone's interested in a bit more, we've got publications on this. Um, and maybe I could invite Marie to, to share her thoughts um, on how cannabis situation has changed compared with 10, 20 years ago and, and add a little bit more food to our, our table on this discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jen. So first, um... I would like to thank you, Eugene, Alexi, and Marika for inviting me um, to this webinar. And uh, I also uh, need to give some words about uh, who I am. Uh, so I am a sociologist and a political scientist, and uh, I'm an expert in, in drug policy with the focus of harm reduction. So that's why I will also speak um, uh, from another perspective that is com complementary to, to, to my colleagues. So perhaps to, I will begin, yes, to, um, uh, to answer to your first question. And uh, what is important for me from my perspective is also to go beyond the, the trends of prevalence that are very important. But I personally think that uh, the way we consider now cannabis and harms has considerably changed this last year, this 20 last years, uh, due, to, uh, due to a growing body uh, of scientific evidence in different areas of research, uh, including neuroscience, public health, and sociology. Even if, um, as um, Eva just said, some topics related to cannabis are still controversial in the scientific literature. What is important for me to say is also that compared to alcohol, the social perception of cannabis have been for a long time driven by moral perceptions due to the illegal status of cannabis in main countries compared to the legal status of cannabis. As a slide one, please. So I wanted also to highlight this publication of David Nutt uh, in The Lancet in 2010. Um, and because this publication introduced uh, a new way to consider the harms of cannabis use by differentiating individual and collective harms first, and secondly, by highlighting that legal drugs such as alcohol and tobacco also need to be considered on the same level as cannabis uh, by setting ideology aside. And by studying all drugs with a scientific lens, lens 
it appears that legal drugs can also cause individual and collective harms as illegal drugs are. And um, it is interesting to note on these graphs from David Nutt's Lancet article that cannabis causes proportionally less collective harms compared to alcohol, for example, because alcohol is involved in a lot of domestic violence events, for example, and that is an area that is totally neglected. So in recent years, several scientific publications also showed that harms from, from drugs are not only linked to the pharmacological power of substances or to genetic differences between people. And I think that it also, but it's also a major change um, since it's these last 20 years. So harms are also caused by a complex environment of risk. That is, this concept of environment of risk is a framework that has been introduced by the sociologist Tim Rhodes uh, in a publication in International Journal of Drug Policy in 2002. And this environment of risk can also be applied to cannabis and it includes structural factors that may increase the harms uh, from cannabis, including the stigma of drug use, the fact that some people live in deprived environment and also the persecution of people who use drugs. Um, and that is also an important topic. There is also another moral uh, misperception that has been broken by scientific evidence. Uh, and this is the distinction between hard and soft drugs. So cannabis has for a long time been considered as a soft drugs. But due to, thanks to scientific um, literature, cannabis cannot be considered um, anymore as a soft drug. But it is also clearly demonstrated that even if the dependence with cannabis exists, the transition to dependence can be less important with cannabis compared to other drugs. For example, a paper that has been published by NIDA in the journal Drugs and Alcohol Dependence in 2011 showed that the cumulative probability estimate of transition to dependence was 68% for nicotine users, 23% for alcohol users, 21% for cocaine users, and 9% for cannabis users. And to conclude on this first point, um, I also think that scientific evidence also helps us to identify better which subgroups are more at risk with cannabis use and where the interventions to reduce arms linked to cannabis use need to be focused. Neuroscience helps us to understand that precocity of cannabis use among adolescents is one of the main risks that needs to be addressed by improving the prevention responses. And public health also showed that early cannabis initiation use among adolescents before 16 years old is associated with low school attainment, especially for young women. I contributed personally to demonstrate the social harm linked to cannabis use in a paper that we published uh, in International Journal of Epidemiology in 2017 with um, a, a colleague, Maria Mel Melchior, who is working uh, also at INSERM. So Jane, that, that's, a, that's why I want to, to, uh, to give you a bit um, for, for this first question. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, second question then. Um, what would you say, and you've, you've begun to, I think you have begun to answer in, 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 in what you said, but, but maybe you'd like to develop a little bit the most pressing challenges right now. Um, and the current cannabis policy debate, how's it having an impact? So uh, to answer to your second question, I think that one of the more pressing challenge now is to address the topic of social inequalities in the area of cannabis use, but in the area of drug use more globally. That's, that's very difficult for me to speak uh, 
only about cannabis <laughs> without having um, a more broader perspective with uh, all the drugs and especially with the topic of social inequalities. So in this topic, scientific literature has also largely shown that socioeconomic inequalities, including poverty, limited education, and marginalization may increase the risk of developing drug use disorders uh, for cannabis and for also other drugs. So can you show the, the second slide, please? So at the international level, uh, this graph uh, that is from uh, Wilkinson and Pickett illustrates perfectly the weight of social inequalities in drug use. But cannabis use harms need also to be understood in their complexity by distinguishing recreational or problematic use regarding social inequalities. For example, in my country, France, social epidemiologic surveys conducted by the French UMCDDA focal point, OFDT, showed that adolescents who are from high and middle class declared higher trends of cannabis use, but at the same time, adolescents from lower social class declared more problematic use of cannabis. And we can explain that um, by two causes. The first, one by, the first one is that um, these adolescents from lower social class live in um, socially and family deprived environment. But a second reason um, that can explain that they have more problem problematic use of cannabis is because these adolescents have less access to prevention and less access to treatment due to a lack of social support and a lack of adequate networks connected to care. And it seems to me that this topic of social inequality is, is a very urgent topic that needs to be addressed. Indeed, there is another most pressing uh, challenge that, is, uh, that we need to address, which is the stigma linked to cannabis use and um, that can um, imped, that may impede uh, a good access to treatment for the most uh, vulnerable group of users. Vulnerable and marginalized groups of users may face barriers to getting treatment services due to discrimination and stigma. And um, now it seems to me that prevention interventions need to seriously address this challenge of reducing social inequalities by allowing people and communities to protect themselves from a problematic use of cannabis. Drug policies are effective only if they really act on improving the social environment in which people live, as it is shown in this graphic representation from a UNODC report. Can you show please the slide three? So on this graphic representation, you can see uh, which are the in the protective favor uh, that can prevent uh, uh, people from drug use, including cannabis use. So uh, we, we have a very, very important uh, body of uh, scientific literature that shows that promoting safe neighborhoods, promoting physical safety and social inclusion, promoting quality of school environments, promoting a better access to health care and improving health and neurological skills, including coping skills and emotional re regulation and favoring caregiver involvement may decrease a lot uh, the trends of cannabis use. And that's why um, I think that it, it is very important to, uh, when we speak about cannabis, to also speak about social inequalities and how improving lives of people in general um, may have a positive impact of in, in decreasing uh, the use of canna cannabis use and especially decreasing the arms uh, related to cannabis. Thanks, Marie, that's great. And really, really appreciate that input and bringing in the absolutely fundamental aspects of uh, the social um, and environmental issues into the discussion.
Okay, panelists, um, I'm going to ask now, I'm going to go back to Jakob um, and then ask each, each panelist in, in turn just to, to have a go at, at summarising in two to three minutes um, some thoughts for the future because we've we've had lots of lots of um, input to suggest we've got a new situation uh, we need to be thinking differently um, maybe our old models the walls are crumbling um, and we we need it's time for a paradigm shift in the way we think about cannabis so I'm going to ask each presenter in turn starting back with Jakob to to, to have a go at telling us what you think we need to do differently and, and how we might to, need to respond in different ways to, to be effective um, with the new challenges um, in the cannabis area. And what might a, a new responses paradigm look like? Jakob, let me put you on the spot, see, just hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one of the most pressing issues is to really focus on the harms that are are currently arising and uh, the complexity of the harms have been described by all of us I think are uh, different dimensions of the complexity perhaps uh, but if we can agree that harms are existent and uh, the harms need to be addressed then uh, we need to think about a strategy, how to address and mitigate these harms. And I think one of the issues that um, will arise first, or one of the first steps that uh, need to be tackled is to uh, decriminalize uh, use, because uh, this is just a huge burden on users that um, uh, uh, creates a lot of uh, harms that is just not justified and we've seen many examples where uh, this worked. And second, um, we need uh, a good understanding on the health harms. Um, I've uh, outlined uh, the a few limitations and Eva also um, broadened uh, aspects on new markets, new um, products uh, that we do not understand well right now and uh, especially the contribution of, for example, synth synthetic ca cannabinoids uh, to uh, treatment presentations. It's just, we don't, just don't know anything about this right now, really. Uh, we don't know why people uh, die uh, from using cannabinoids, uh, synthetic cannabinoids. So all of this really needs to be addressed and we need a, a good understanding of the harms and then develop uh, a, a regulation model that really accounts for all the different complexity. And I'm really happy that Marie, uh, she addressed uh, the, the deprivation issue in this. And what she, what she mentioned that uh, uh, people with de deprived backgrounds are more likely to use cannabis more risky. The uh, same applies to alcohol, uh, which I study a lot. And uh, we need to understand this and a regulation model needs to understand that availability cannot be higher in more deprived uh, neighborhoods, which we see in North America and a lot of uh, uh, US states and Canada. So this is something that we need to understand where we need to really think about in a broader perspective and then um, act accordingly to really uh, act on that goal to mitigate the harms. And um, yeah, I think that would be a really uh, par paradigm shift. Thank you very much. Harm focus model, Eva, over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I am supporting uh, Jakob's, <laughs> Jakob's ideas and thoughts. Um, first, I think uh, risks of cannabis are differently pronounced. Not every user has the same risk, but we need to know who is at risk. So we need better health monitoring. We need different health indicators. We need the resources at national, at regional levels to, to do this. Um, we have a very poor assessment of cannabis use so far. We don't have a gold standard. We compare sometimes um, <laughs> apples to other <laughs> fruit. And uh, so we, we really think we really should improve uh, the way we assess uh, cannabis use and cannabis-related re harms. 
And uh, I also think we need um, better um, interventions of prevention and treatment. We need new approaches. And uh, it's very important that cannabis researchers are supported, that barriers are taken away from cannabis research. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult. We have uh, high regulations. We often do not have the political will to do our research. And um, as I know from colleagues around the globe, we, we really need money to do our work. <laughs> it's not enough to do systematic review. We have to do original work. And my second thought is it's, it's not time to sit and wait. It's time to take action. And it's, it's really essential to join forces and to bring together the different key players. And it's also a good idea then when politics listens to, to science, but that's not enough. We have to come together, uh, politics, scientists, uh, public health, patients, and uh, to give advice to policymakers, and uh, that's what I I stand for. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eva. So some new some new health indicators, improved assessment, and actually working together more in a multidisciplinary way to to advise and, and get some policy development and change. Thank you. I think I just my my uh, IT just went for a minute. Hope I'm back. Um, and finally, could I bring in Marie back into the debate, please, to, to give us your thoughts on what we, we need to do differently um, and what a new responses paradigm might look like? Well, I, I think that um, well, I think that we only um, share the, the same concern about um, the, the, the risk um, related to, to, to cannabis. So this risk exists. Uh, they are more important in some subgroups. But what we also need to have in mind uh, is that um, the criminalization um, of cannabis and the persecution of uh, people who use cannabis um, uh, is not working. So that's why uh, now we can see that at the international level, there, there is a growing movement uh, of um, new alternatives uh, to criminalization of drug use. Um, so that includes uh, the legalization of cannabis in some countries since uh, 2013, or the decriminalization of all of drugs that Portugal since uh, that chose um, 20 years ago. And um, that's very complex to, to <laughs> Um, to, to, to know what are the best models. Um, and as uh, Alexis said uh, in introduction, we, that's not possible to say that uh, cannabis legalization will be a magic bullet. Uh, what we know um, now from the, legaliza the cannabis legalization is that uh, um, it, do it, it doesn't increase the uh, the level of use among adolescents. And that's something that is very important um, because well, one of the groups that is more at risk for cannabis use uh, are the, the adolescent. And there are well, some very recent um, uh, publications, uh, especially one publication in JAMA Network, perhaps two or three days ago, showed that um, uh, in the US, in the United States, um, they, they, did, um, uh, they, have, they did a study um, uh, about the last 20 years of use among adolescents, and um, they, they found that there was a, a little decrease of cannabis use among adolescents. So that's the same also in Canada, uh, I discussed a lot with my Canadian colleague uh, about the effect and the impact of legalization and the fear that legalization can lead to an increase uh, among adolescents um, seems not to work uh, because in Canada, they also didn't have any increase uh, among adolescents. So that's something that is important to have in mind. 
Uh, and at the opposite, I can't speak about my country uh, because France has one of the most repressive uh, policy towards cannabis um, in Europe. And we have the highest level of cannabis use among adolescents. And as Jacob uh, just showed before, we have also very, very high increase um, in uh, THC um, levels in, in, in cannabis uh, in France. So that what we know uh, now is that uh, when we want to uh, criminalize um, the, the governments that have decided to criminalize uh, cannabis uh, have not good result uh, with this type of policy. So that's why we need to, to, to have some alternatives. But with the, the legalization aspect, I think that it is very, very important to um, have in mind that we need to always prioritize a public health perspective. And my fear is that now with the legalization of cannabis, some countries think that um, they will have a lot of economical uh, benefits uh, with cannabis legalization. And these economical benefits can also lead to what we call a big canna. <laughs> And uh, that can be compared with the big pharma uh, that the United States uh, have to face with the opioid markets. So that's why that, that's a, complete, a very complex question. Uh, but personally, I think that now uh, the scientific literature um, agrees that criminalization is not a good solution. Uh, and that we need to, to think about alternatives. That's great. Thank you very much, Marie. And thanks to everybody for, for those uh, challenging and insightful um, answers. And I'm, I'm going to move now into um, opening up the floor to questions. So, so if everybody can be prepared, and I will start while Marika's having a little look through the chat, and also uh, our presenters can have a look through the chat too to see if there's things that they want to pick out. But I just want to recognise there's been lots of um, allusion and comments about the, the in North America, shall we say, the states and, and Canada, and it's not very surprising. Just just now, Marie, you were talking about Big Carno and. Alexi mentioned green gold. Um, lots going on there, and we're, we're kind of watching, if you like. I think countries are watching, um, and we see different models, the health, perhaps the health-centered Canadian model and, and the more economic um, uh, models we're seeing in the US. I'm wondering implications for responses. So it's kind of one of my questions. If we're following a little bit what we see, not just the, not just harms, but harms is part of it, but also um, the interventions that may be being developed in, in these countries. I'm wondering, I mean, I'm, I'm aware perhaps of Canada and some, some interesting harm reduction uh, guidelines, for example, Fisher and, and, and I'll have been working on for some years. Um, Less, I, le I know less about treatment, and I'm wondering again: is have there been any interesting developments in cannabis treatment? Maybe Eva, I can throw that one at you to start with, and, and maybe our other panelists might want to come in. But any thoughts on those? Uh, in Canada, specifically or in general? I'm just thinking in the US as a little bit ahead and opening up, and and. Um, are we seeing or are we seeing parallel developments in in uh, in the in the clinical side um, with the open markets? As far as I know, the latest advancement in the treatment of cannabis use disorders is the application of uh, cannabis-based medicine. So uh, I think that's a new trend. It's coming from the United States, and cannabis medicine is also applied to. Um, other addictions, so for example, um, opioid dependence, withdrawal of opioids, um, coca uh, cocaine dependence, and uh, there's a small trial of, of tobacco addiction. But I think in general, not so much has happened. And what we can see in the United States that uh, treatment rates are uh, decreasing, that uh, people who uh, don't get uh, treatment instead of punishment as uh, in, in 
more recent um, the past so so that could be something that's happening <laughs> also in europe that um cannabis is not considered as a problematic drug and there is more acceptance of cannabis and uh, less pressure for people to come to treatment so that may be a future trend that that people don't come to treatment anymore or that there are people at risk and um, we don't get in touch with them or it could be that we can get in touch with them much better because there is less less uh, stigma and people are more willing to come so i really don't know what's going to happen so but I think that cannabis uh, stigma is a high barrier to come to treatment. And many of my patients, they ask me, uh, Dr. Hoch, is it really necessary that you tell the health insurance company that I have a, a cannabis use problem? Cannot, can't you say it's a depression? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, there are many consequences from this uh, disorder. Yeah. Unpleasant concept. But when it comes to treatment, I don't see so much development, not psychosocial or uh, um, psychosocial treatments. No. Okay, thanks. I mean, um, would, would Jacob or Marie like to come in on the harm, cannabis harm reduction side? Marie? Yes, personally, I, I think that the Canadian model is, is probably. Um, more interesting for Europe um, compared to the, to the US model because uh, uh, what is interesting with the Canadian model is that they, uh, they, they have this legalization of, 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 of cannabis, but they, they try to do this in a more um, with a, uh, an involve, a commitment of the state uh, that is more important. So, they, they try to regulate uh, more um, the cannabis legalization, and uh, it will probably um, uh, prevent uh, from the risk of the big canna that, that I mentioned before. And what is also very interesting uh, in Canada is that um, as Canada has, uh, in general, a less proactive model uh, in, in, for drug policies and is more uh, involved uh, in harm reduction. Uh, they also try to, to, to develop a lot of intervention to prevent cannabis. Uh, and uh, these interventions are um, uh, especially psychosocial uh, intervention that try to improve the self-esteem uh, of young people to allow them um, to, 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 to resist uh, uh, to, to the influence of peers if they don't want to use cannabis. And uh, all these psychosocial interventions that can increase self-esteem as an, an area of intervention that, that needs to be, to be developed. And, and that's the way uh, Canada has, has, has chosen. Thank you. Okay, Marika, maybe I could um, bring you in and you've been following the chat quite closely and perhaps... Um, Yes, there are there are some questions on how you measure the the uh, percentage and the average percentage of TAC in in the cannabis that is consumed. These are, I think, mainly for Jacob. I don't know if you want to to gather them. Overall, mm -hmm. then there are comments on on the paper by Nat discussing if there were cannabis strains at the time, if it is updated enough, etc. And so we can start with these two, because there are many questions. We want to be able to take them over, <laughs> but, but probably we can comment on these two mains. Okay, so the, the first one was, was for Jakob on... Uh, Jakob, did you... Start. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so measuring um, THC in cannabis is actually not too complicated. Uh, there are a few standard uh, methods to do, uh, to do this. Um, the problem really is, um, do we get a representative sample of cannabis that is actually being used by the people in the target population? So there's been a, a couple of uh, pilot studies 
um, where people asked uh, users to provide joints uh, to the research team. And then the research team actually analyzed the joints. They picked out the cannabis or the, the resin uh, from the joints, they separated uh, the tobacco from the, from the rest, and then they analyzed it. Uh, the samples. So that works, uh, but uh, for example, a pilot or very uh, well cited study in Spain, uh, colleagues of mine um, done this, uh, found very, very low, surprisingly low levels of uh, THC in th those samples. Uh, so um, approaches like this, are, I think very meaningful uh, in understanding what is going on uh, in the markets and also to have a benchmark separate uh, from the law enforcement agencies, uh, something um, uh, that uh, is very native to research to have independent, independent assessments of the same phenomena to really understand the picture as a whole. And, uh, but to really connect this to a previous topic uh, that we've uh, just touched is getting these kind of studies done is incredibly complicated. We have tried to do this in Germany, um, no chance. There's no one uh, giving us money for this. And there's uh, no one uh, that actually could uh, uh, guarantee that we are not being put into prison for this because taking joints from uh, users, just to take them, give it to the pharmacist, get it analyzed there because pharmacists can do this uh, because we are just taking them and as a middleman, we could be thrown into prison. So this is the, the type of barrier that we are facing right now in this, kind, uh, in this field, in this research field. And uh, similar things going on with synthetic cannabinoids. We have a laboratory that do routine testing, testings of uh, synthetic cannabinoids in uh, blood uh, and urine uh, tests uh, samples. And we have the data, we can analyze the data, we can uh, do this, but no one's giving us money for this. We uh, try to uh, 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 yeah, write grants and yeah, it's, it's very complicated. So you see uh, there's uh, lots of efforts going on um, to really understand this better, but um, barriers are high. Maybe uh, with research. Eva, you would like may to I, say. May I add something? <laughs> it's the same to CBD content in cannabis products. It would be so important to know the ratio, yeah. But we don't really have the information on a regional level. So, um, and also we know from the cannabis users that there are other ingredients. They shouldn't be in the <laughs> cannabis products, uh, hairspray and, and, and other constituents uh, you don't want to use. So uh, that's, that's, that's difficult as a researcher. Remaining on, on the risks, there, there is one question asking how can you disentangle the risks linked to the contemporary consume of tobacco with the risks linked to the increased THC? Quite briefly, because we want also to move to other questions asked. Any, anybody want to uh, have a go at that one? The risks linked to tobacco to the uh, risks linked to THC? Or do we just say it's a very good question and we... we uh... No, it is. <laughs> Jacob, do you want to answer? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I can just briefly. Uh, so uh, it's incredibly difficult, especially in countries from an epidemiological point of view. In countries uh, in Europe, it's incredibly difficult because about 90% of the users use both cannabis and tobacco. So disentangling the two phenomena and the two risk factors is incredibly difficult just out of numerical numbers. You have you need really large sample sizes to get the uh, sufficient number of people who only use cannabis. This is different in the US and Canada where less than 20% actually use tobacco uh, and cannabis or cannabis combined with tobacco. So again, uh, we have to rely on North American research and fortunately uh, Canadian uh, colleagues actually do get uh, some money to do this. Uh, but uh, only European data will be very, very um, uh, uh, difficult to do this, really. Thanks. I'd, I'd really like to get your second question, Marika, because I think it's really interesting. The, the one about the Daily Nuts study, it was 10, you know, it was 2010. 
would it look different if it was done now with what we're saying about the changes? Maybe I can um, bring Marie back in as she presented the that slide. What do you think, Marie? Would would there be any? Would it look different with the changes in the cannabis market and the related? Uh, I, I I don't think so because uh, recently uh, David not updated uh, in other um, publications. Um, this trend and alcohol is still at the top level. And mm -hmm. that's also the case with tobacco. But I think that uh, it's important not to misunderstand um, uh, what David Nutt wants to, uh, to demonstrate. It, it doesn't want to demonstrate that there, is, there are no risk <laughs> with cannabis, mm -hmm. but he, he wants to, to demonstrate that it's very important to have a broader view of uh, uh, all the risks that exist with substances and that the fact that some substance, the, the, the decisions that government make to um, criminalize some substance and to give them uh, illegal status doesn't mean that they are more dangerous compared to other. And, and that's why that's not uh, because alcohol uh, is allowed uh, in a lot of countries that there are no risk with alcohol or with tobacco. And I think that it, it's important to have, to have that in mind because for adolescents, for example, we focused a lot uh, uh, on the cannabis risks because it's illegal uh, in, uh, the majority of, uh, in the majority of countries um, in Europe. But sometimes this focus on cannabis um, uh, makes some governments totally forgot that there are also risks uh, with, uh, with alcohol. And that's especially the, 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 friend, the, the, the case in France and due to economical arguments. And that's why uh, it's very important for me to say for cannabis and for alcohol that um, the public health uh, needs to be uh, always a priority. And, uh, and we, have, we need also to have a, a global uh, perspective on prevention because the adolescents who smoke uh, cannabis, they also uh, drink uh, alcohol and uh, smoke tobacco. And uh, we need to, to, to have a broader perspective to address all the, the risk of these uh, substances. Thanks, Marie. Marika, do we have time for one more question? Are we? I, I just would like to, to I, uh, because there are many questions on the same topic, that is synthetic cannabinoids, if you can say one word about it. Another question asks if you, when you analyze data for the demand on treatment, you also considered forced treatment, people that is sent to treatment. Um, maybe. B. Jakob, would you like to say a word on synthetic cannabinoids in the context of our discussions? Uh, I think we've covered uh, this maybe already. I'm not quite sure. Uh, so in, in, in the context of, of, of uh, treatment, uh, both we don't have the data for both synthetic cannabinoids and uh, legal uh, referrals or mandatory treatment. Uh, so right now, uh, like I was, I was trying to get the data for Germany. It's quite difficult. Uh, it's maybe possible, but it's just incredibly difficult. Uh, so and uh, thinking about this on the European level would require initiatives like the EMCDDA to put this on their agenda. Um, so this needs to be a, a priority from a political point of view, not really from the researcher point of view. Thanks, and I can also say, say as a, one of our mini guides, the, after the cannabis one, I think the number six or seven is going to be on responding to new psychoactive substances. For those that are interested in reading more about the range of responses, that's also to cathinones and synthetic opioids, but we will also be launching within the next two weeks uh, a publication on that slightly broader topic. Yeah. And Marika, the last question, was about considering in the demand for treatment, people that is forced to treatment. And then this is really the last one because I think it's very important for us to hear from Alexis, his consideration on all this debate and we don't want to take too much of the time. So if you have a brief comment on this, I promise the people asking the questions that we will let them have to our speakers so that you can answer through the email.
Thanks. Eva, I'm going to ask you, is there any, any thoughts? Is this something that... Uh, yes, it's, I think it's the paradigm uh, treatment instead of punishment, so that people are um, put to treatment instead of prison. And uh, as a, a therapist, it's, it's not so easy if someone comes without any motivation for change, but... Um, that's, that's, that's the case very often. So we apply motivation interviewing techniques and try to find <laughs> something people like to change, especially their cannabis use and associated uh, uh, problems, social problems. But in, there are uh, European countries, for example, Poland, uh, with this uh, shift in paradigm. And this is a country where we trained a lot uh, in, in the last uh, 10 years. So they put a lot of um, money and effort <laughs> to um, improve the treatment system and have very good uh, health specialists, addiction spe uh, specialists. Thanks, Eva. And, and a big thank you from me. Really enjoyed this uh, conversation and I very much appreciate all the panelists' input and, and for sharing their time and thoughts with us. Thank you from me. Back to America and Alexi. Thank you. So while I share, thank you to Alessandra, the link to register for more news on our response guide, I ask Alexis to intervene for his closing remark. Thank you very much, Marika and Jane. And also, I would like to seize the opportunity to congratulate and thank all the EMC DDA staff that uh, since last year, uh, more than one year ago, started uh, engaging this new adventure of the EMCDDA webinars. Um, I think you, you are all very committed and, uh, and we have fantastic experiences. And I think one of the key assets of the EMCDDA webinars is that it's not EMCDDA speaking or not EMCDDA speaking alone, but uh, that we give the floor to the best possible experts to open and uh, feed the debate and not to bring a kind of a, a verite unique or a unique uh, truth. So uh, very difficult. Uh, I certainly don't have the pretension to summarize everything that was said. Also, it was so rich that I'm afraid I would have just to spend another half an hour to just highlight many of the things that have been said. But uh, my, my feeling during uh, the webinar, listening to, to the presentations and the question, and again, Eva, uh, Marie, and Jakob, uh, very, really many thanks, and I really look forward to meet you face to face in the real world, uh, whether in Lisbon or Paris or Munich, uh, wherever you are. So I think uh, maybe we should speak about the cannabis paradox. Uh, because the, the more I listen to you, the more I read on this, the more I follow this issue. Uh, I, I, it's a real paradox. We have a big stigma. Uh, sometimes it looks like the same stigma uh, as it applies for people who inject heroin or uh, use other drugs that have a much more uh, damaging effect for their health. Um, um, I don't mean th that stigma is justified. Of course, in any case, I think it's not justified at all. And clearly, it's also from the perspective of the European Union strategy and action plan, uh, there is a clear priority to fight against stigma. Um, the, there is the, the issue of criminalization. And on the other side, it's not really considered as a priority for research. It's not really considered as a priority for innovative treatments. Uh, the, there is a kind of a social or political ignorance of the health uh, consequences. And I was thinking that uh, maybe one factor that can contribute to the fact that even in some hospitals, because it's not only about policymakers or politicians, uh, I think ourselves 10, 15 years ago, uh, I think the perception, even we as professionals, we had of uh, how uh, dangerous was cannabis uh, certainly has changed over time together with knowledge, but also among other things with the increase in the concentration in THC. Uh, because if we compare the, the pot that was smoked in May 68 in the streets of Paris, for instance, or in Berlin, and if we say today, we see today 
uh, the, there is such a difference in the in the content and the potential risk that means we don't talk about the same thing. Um, I think one one of the factors that 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 are actually amplifying this or have contributed to amplify is, uh, is the fact that we we observe uh, I find more and more kind of fragmentation of policies. Uh, we we more and more deal only with little bits and pieces of a problem. I think it's partly due to the overall approach, including uh, the last decades, there was an evolution in the concept of public management that was not always the best way to, to see public management, I think. Uh, and, and, it, and it's not only about drugs, even if certainly we, we can say, I think that there is a, from what we heard uh, today, the, it just illustrates that there is a fragmentation of thinking drugs. Um, and I, I would like to, to welcome a, a point that was made by each of you uh, that, that, uh, that I shared uh, also myself at the uh, Fédération Addiction Conference, conference in, in MESS online, in my case, uh, 10 days ago. I, I think, yes, we, we need to start from the risks and not from the moral, uh, it's not a question of moralistic approach. Um, uh, and, and I would say in French, we speak about réduction des risques, which is not exactly the same than talking about harm reduction. And uh, I made the point that probably we need to reintegrate in, in the same concept, the two elements, the risk and the harm. Because for me, the, the risk behavior comes before the harm appears or not. Uh, so we, we need to avoid to frank, fragment more. And, and I think when you say uh, we need to, to move from treatment uh, uh, instead of punishment, uh, I think it, it all illustrates the need overall to rehumanize. Uh, and, and when I say to rehumanize the policies, uh, it's, it's not just a blah, blah theory philosophy. I, I think I, I give you a concrete example that uh, I experienced in some of my field visits and in the contacts with some, some of the audience today and others, is, uh, is basically the solution for some of the problems we are talking about. It's not just the, the setting. It's not because you create a treatment center that you have solved the problem in the community. And the debate on the DCRs in Paris or in, uh, in uh, Athens, uh, I visited Okana with uh, uh, President Theokharis, and, uh, and uh, he explained me that uh, the municipality was going to invest uh, to, to provide some assistance to, the, to people living in the neighborhood where they were going to open the new DCR. Because obviously, who, who would be crazy enough in places where there is a very huge social vulnerability if there was money spent for those people who are using drugs who are uh, extremely socially deviant. And at the same time, there would be nothing done or offered to the citizens who live there longer time than the people who are using drugs and who are facing a, 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 a wide range of problems. So these, these calls, and it, actually it's not new. Uh, so so to, to, to reach uh, slowly but surely my, my conclusion for today, uh, I think what, what we can share with you as CMCDDA um, is also the fact that um, we can and we have to learn from what we do for 30 years in Europe. Because yes, we have problems. Yes, we need more research. Yes, we need to be less dogmatic. I heard uh, one day, uh, just when we launched the, the EMCDDA publication on the medical use of cannabinoids, and we, on purpose, we never speak about medical cannabis because there are so many components in cannabis plant that it makes no sense. We don't speak about therapeutic or medical baobab, but in some cases we can speak about the use of morphine to treat cancer pain in, among children. And there is a body of evidence that confirmed that there is a possible use. But that person was interviewed uh, on the national radio and uh, he, she was saying that uh, their association of uh, pharmacies would oppose uh, with all the energy the development of any medicine that would contain, contain THC. And this is exactly the opposite of science. And if we were doing that, that we, would not be, uh, we would not allow ourselves to continue to use morphine 
which is the best treatment for acute pain. There is no, nothing else that reached the same efficacy. And we see interesting developments that we should avoid to lose. Uh, some initiatives about therapeutic use of uh, LSD, uh, the therapeutic use of MDMA for the treatment of post-traumatic disorders. In some cases, recently, the, the use of ketamine for treatment of certain forms of depression. And I heard more recently, even the use of GHB, if I'm not wrong, and there are some clinical trials. So this calls for uh, opening, having a more broader approach of, uh, of the problem, uh, but at the same time, being more inclusive uh, in terms of uh, uh, what is the information we as the European Drugs Agency, we share with our customers, the EU and the national decision makers, but also in our support to the practitioners in demand and supply reduction, because I, I think we, we, we have a huge experience. Do you know, do you remember that 25, 30 years ago in Spain, the National Action Plan on Drugs was organized encouraging not only the autonomous communities, but the cities, to have a member of the council in charge of drug. They even organized training for them to have more comprehensive policies. So we have a body of experience we, we should be more aware of, but we can also already use. And, and certainly to, to finish, I would say, I would thank again the, uh, the participants, the audience, our three uh, guests. Uh, and I, I would make a plea together with you, not for us, not for our budget, uh, but, but for the fact that for many of those topics you have mentioned today, like for others, we are covering uh, with the work of the MCDD. We need more and better research. And when I say more and better research, I don't think only about quantitative research, but also qualitative. And certainly the evaluation of services uh, is a key element today and even more in the future. But I really believe it cannot be addressed only with statistics and quantitative research. We need also, there is good and as qualitative research is as scientific as quantitative, it's just different. And the use of the results is different, but we need both. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexis. Rehumanizing will become one of the next keywords for many of us. Um, we recognize we didn't answer all the questions. We will facilitate communication among the speakers and, and the, the audience that has a still question. I, I thank you, uh, Jane, for, for her chairing this very, very um, interesting and also complex uh, discussion. I will launch a poll for our public just to make sure we know what is their opinion, but you can leave if you have other other uh, issues to handle. I will remain a few minutes to give people time to answer our poll. Register to the newsletter for the response guide and be with us for the next webinar will be on the legal status and the debate around European countries. And then as Jen said, more on cannabis. Thank you very much, everybody.